Good morning. My name is Dan Goldberg. On behalf of Pinnacle Financial Partners, I just want to thank you so much for joining us for this very special Pinnacle Forum. We're in for a fascinating and a timely discussion. John Meacham is a Chattanooga native, having attended the Macaulay School, then Sewanee, where he graduated salutatorian and summa cum laude. John's newest work, And There Was Light, Abraham Lincoln and the American Struggle, has critics raving. The Washington Post called it a guiding light for our times, and I think you'll agree that it's, important, it's an important reminder of why our morals and strong convictions of what's right is so important in our country today. John's other recent works include The Hope of Glory, Reflections on the Last Words of Jesus from the Cross, and His Truth is Marching On, John Lewis and the Power of Hope, both were New York Times bestsellers. In that same year, HBO aired a documentary on the soul of America, The Battle for Our Better Angels. All of this followed other monumental biographies, including Destiny and Power, his celebrated work about George H.W. Bush. In 2009, John was awarded the Pulitzer Prize for his book, American Lion, Andrew Jackson in the White House. He also achieved international recognition for his works on Thomas Jefferson, his intriguing Franklin and Winston about Roosevelt and Churchill, and American Gospel. Along the way, John was honored by Vanderbilt University with an endowed chair. He's also been appointed the first canon historian of Washington National Cathedral, the seat of the Episcopal Church. Through his works, John has become one of America's most beloved historians. He delivered the eulogy for the First Lady, Barbara Bush, and several months later, he was the anchor eulogist for his dear friend, the 41st President of the United States, George H.W. Bush. To those who know him, John is as good a man and father as he is a gifted mind. And once again, we are so proud that John is a native Chattanoogan. So please help me give a warm welcome to John Meacham. So I was thinking, yeah, I am all those things. Uh, and maybe you weren't being quite fulsome enough. Um, and my mind went back, uh, some of you may know this, but it was about 12 years ago, I was on the Washington Mall at the National Book Festival. And I was on my way at that point to give my talk about Andrew Jackson, when a woman ran up to me, which doesn't happen enough, <laughs> or ever, actually. And she said, oh my God, it's you. And I said, well, yes, you know, existentially speaking, that's hard to argue with. And um, I live in Nashville, so I have to come to Chattanooga to use existential as an adverb, so thank you. Um, <laughs> She said, your books have meant so much to me. Will you wait right here? I'm going to go buy your new book and have you sign it. And I said, yes, ma'am. And I stood there thinking, this is the way the world is supposed to be, right? Women are supposed to run up to you. They're supposed to buy your book. It was a twofer. Hand to God, she brought back John Grisham's latest novel. Um, so whenever I think I'm a good man, um, I remind myself that somewhere in America, there's a woman with a forged copy of The Runaway Jury, right? So I signed it. Uh, that's a true story. Uh, the second part is also true. Uh, at that point, I was writing the book about President Bush. It took me 17 years. It was supposed to be posthumous, but the son of a bitch wouldn't die. Um, I'd bring it up. He'd say, not going to do it. Um, as Dana Carvey once said, the key to doing Bush 41's voice was Mr. Rogers trying to be John Wayne. It's a perfect description. <laughs> um, but I was, I was going to Maine to see the Bushes. And for some reason, it was just the three of us at lunch that day. And that almost never happened. Uh, Bush world was like a wasp Epcot, right? Uh, the Oak Ridge boys would be in the kitchen. Gorbachev would be on the putting green. Billy Graham would be in the kitchen. It was just, that all happened once. But for some reason, it was just us. And I told the story about being mistaken for Grisham. And I will confess to you, my, my native city, that it was an entirely transparent attempt to get either the former president or the former first lady to say, oh, you're so much more important than John Grisham, right? So I had cast the fly out on the water, and Barbara Bush looks across the table in that inimitable way of hers and said, well, how do you think poor John Grisham would feel? You know, he's a very handsome man. <laughs> so it was a bad weekend, uh, all in all. I told that story at Mrs. Bush's funeral, and. But three days later, I got an email from Grisham. And the subject line was, I'm worried about my fans, dot, dot, dot. And I opened it, he said, my wife's gotten 12 sympathy notes from people who thought you were speaking at my funeral. 
So the, the, the story goes on. Uh, I'm delighted to be here. Uh, the city that uh, absolutely formed uh, me and everything I do. Uh, the institutions of St. Nicholas School and Macaulay School and the Chattanooga Times. Um, we have three headmasters of Macaulay School here, uh, Spencer, uh, Robert Kirk Walker, and Lee Burns. As Henry Adams once said about the movement from Washington to Grant, that might disprove Darwin. <laughs> I'll wait, it's good. It's a good line. Um, and you know you're in middle age when your best friend growing up is the headmaster of a school. That just means you're really, really old. Uh, uh, delighted to be here because of Pinnacle and, um, and Craig, thank you. Um, so last week was a remarkable uh, election in the life of the country. Uh, midterms are not always that. They are... Uh, tend to be referendum uh, on an incumbent president and an incumbent administration. And what happened last week was, if that is in fact a referendum, the vote was we would like to uh, turn down the temperature, turn down the volume, acknowledge the rule of law, engage the Constitution, and let's get back to a time when we can argue about marginal tax rates and immigration policy as opposed to arguing about reality itself. And I think that that was a, uh, my own personal view is that was a good decision. Um, I'm not a, some of, this, some of this may sound partisan, I don't mean it to, I'm not a Democrat, I'm not a Republican. Uh, I voted for presidents of both parties. I even voted for Corker once. <laughs> yeah. Once, once. Uh, and, I really do believe that there's something in the essence of Chattanooga and of Tennessee that is of national utility, which is a focus on policy choices, prosperity, equality, opportunity, with a focus on solving problems as opposed to taking every possible argument to total war. Politics at its best is a mediation of differences. It's not a uh, arena in which we go at each other's throats constantly. And when we can do that, and the best part of the Tennessee tradition has been to do that, we are, I think, in a better place nationally as well. Um, I wanna talk about a couple of characteristics that I think managed to prevail uh, in the last week or so. Um, and without these habits of heart and mind, I don't think we can stay on this, this track. Um, one is curiosity. We need to be interested, not simply in what each, one another thinks, but in the broad forces that are shaping the world we're in. That requires us not to always think before a discussion starts that we have the answer. Reason, experience, changing data, changing circumstance, that's the nature of a fallen, frail, and fallible world. And if we don't acknowledge that and don't seek to understand, then we fall back on that total war. And democracy is actually quite counterintuitive because we're wired to take as much as we can in order to make sure we have enough, right? That's what we've been doing since we climbed out of the sludge. And what democracy insists on is that there is both a moral utility to giving as well as taking, but also a practical one. And this is not in any way a partisan point. Give and take manages to secure a constitutional arena in which we can resolve problems. If we lose that constitutional arena, if we break the United States of America permanently, we're not gonna get it back. This is a remarkable experiment. And if democracy were easy, everybody would do it. But we are amazingly heading into 250 years, we are the oldest 
continuous experiment in popular government in our kind, of our kind. And so asking fundamental questions is important. And curiosity is key to that. When Thomas Jefferson wrote what became the most important sentence ever originally rendered in English, that all men are created equal and are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, a sentence that has changed more lives around the world than any other and continues to do so, he was setting us on a path, giving us a standard to try to reach. Now, I am careful. I just said it's the most important sentence ever originally rendered in English. Reminds me of the story about the Texas school board candidate who was against teaching Spanish in the public schools and said on the stump one day, if English was good enough for our Lord Jesus Christ, it's good enough for Texas. <laughs> so, how that sounded in the original Aramaic, I don't know. But um, <laughs> when George W. was governor of Texas, I told him that story. He went, <laughs> that's pretty funny, <laughs> asshole. <laughs> uh, so, so we go on. But Jefferson wrote that sentence not simply because he was a bright young politician of Virginia, though he was, but because he had been curious about what was unfolding in the Western world. And so what had been unfolding in the three or four centuries heading into Philadelphia in 1787? Gutenberg, the introduction of movable type, which democratized information, the Protestant reformations, the translation of sacred scripture into the vernacular, the scientific revolution, the European enlightenment, the Scottish moral enlightenment, an entire reorientation of the world, if you think about it, from being seen as vertical, where popes and princes and prelates and kings were either by an accident of birth or an incident of election, were given authority over all of us. That's the way the world was organized for millennia. What the American experiment was about was making that vertical experiment more horizontal, that we in fact were born with the capacity to determine our own destinies. It's a biblical understanding of human equality. It found political manifestation in the Western liberal tradition and its fullest political manifestation in the United States of America in the Declaration of Independence. Jefferson could not have rendered that sentence if he had not been engaged in that conversation. And so it's incumbent on us to continue to be engaged in the conversations that shape who we are. Does the rule of law matter? Do full and free elections matter? Does the truth matter? Yes, as Pilate said, what, what is truth? And then Jesus didn't answer in a frustrating way. I when you kindly mentioned my book about Jesus. I mentioned to Corker, that was a tough interview to get. Um, <laughs> one of the things I have in common, so I've written about American presidents and Jesus. The thing they have in common is that most of the presidents thought they were Jesus. <laughs> so that, there is a, there's a continuum there. We have to be curious. The second is we need to be more candid with each other, uh, not in expressing our opinions. God knows we have plenty of those. Um, when I'm honored to give commencement speeches, uh, something I say that, and all the grandparents love it, the kids are all hung over, um, <laughs> so they don't pay much attention. But just in terms of social media, just because we have the means to express an opinion quickly does not mean you have an opinion worth expressing quickly. And being in the, they love that. I also say write thank you notes on real paper. And what's really interesting is the kids try to figure out what paper is. So that's it. I had a student at Vanderbilt a couple of months ago who asked me about student newspapers and how we used to do them. I said, well, you know, you'd, you'd print out the pages and you'd cut them and you'd make them into columns and then you'd paste them. And this young woman raised her hand and said, oh my God, that's where cut and paste came from. <laughs> and I was like, ah, oh, shit, I'm old. Um, I said, well, what do you think carb CC means? They said, well, I don't know. I said, carbon copy. She said, well, we're against carbon. I said, not that kind of carbon. <laughs> but we need to be straightforward and honest about what we're facing. And that's really hard. Uh, this is a city that is uh, based on politeness. It's based on manners. I, I do what I do because my grandfather used to take me to court when I was a little guy, uh, six years old. I've always wondered what the defendants thought I was doing up there. Um, but we would sit at the Reed House and with you know, the 
district attorney and uh, Ray Brock and others. And it was about being polite. And that's great. I will say my first journalistic inquiry, just parenthetically, was about um, uh, Bookie Turner. Y'all remember Bookie? Yeah. So when I was about seven, I asked my grandfather, why do they call Commissioner Turner Bookie? Yeah. That's, that's probably someone's cousin. Um, and he said, well, I don't know. You should go ask him. So I trundled over and I said, Commissioner Turner, why do they call you Bookie? And he said, son, it's because I love to read. <laughs> now, you may remember the grand jury disagreed. Um, they found it more of an occupational descriptor. But, um, but that was the beginning of, that was the wing of a butterfly. Um, so we're, we're built to be polite, but we need to be candid. We need to be honest about what we're facing. And we are facing, uh, there are significant forces in the life of the country, again, I'm not saying this as some crazy MSNBC liberal, which is redundant. Um, that's like the Darwin joke, it's funny, you all wait. Um, I'm saying this because self-evidently, the constitutional order is under stress. It is under less stress today than it was eight days ago, but it's still under stress. And we can't ever give up that kind of eternal vigilance. But we need, so we need to be straightforward about it. And I base this somewhat on uh, the lesson from Franklin Roosevelt and Winston Churchill. Uh, Roosevelt said in the winter of 1942, when things were going very poorly in World War II, he said that in, it was Washington's birthday, he quoted Thomas Paine, who said that tyranny like hell is not easily conquered, and the American people deserve to have it straight from the shoulder even if the news is bad, or particularly if the news is bad. And Roosevelt was borrowing that point somewhat from Winston Churchill, who had said uh, in the same season that the British people, or the American people, can face any misfortune with fortitude and buoyancy as long as they are convinced that those who are in charge of their affairs are not deceiving them or are not themselves dwelling in a fool's paradise. Fascinating, right? It's a two-pronged test. We want to make sure they're not lying to us and also that they're not lying to themselves. And if you can meet those two tests, the covenant of modern democracies is we're in. But we have to be straightforward on those. And it's uncomfortable, and 40% of the country is going to think you're being divisive. But you know what? We're not a 60-40 country. We're a 51-49 country. We always have been. There are only three presidential elections since World War II where 60% of us agreed on who should be president of the United States. 1964, 1972, and 1984. Otherwise, we're very, very narrowly divided. I admire my friend Senator Corker and Governor Haslam and, and so many others, not least because I don't have the psychological wherewithal to know that when I go out in the world, just about every second person I see would like to fire me, right? I mean, with you, it's probably more, but um, that's why he quit. Anyway, um, I am so glad I'm here. This is the only time I've been able to do this to Corker and he hasn't talked back. This is just fantastic. This is fantastic. Um, I've always wondered why, we have two mayors of Chattanooga here, you the best job in the world and you go to the Senate. I, don't I still don't understand that. Not a, not a wise choice, but if you're mayor of Chattanooga, just stick with it. Um, without understanding that we are narrowly divided and at our best, we will be narrowly divided, then we set, ourselves, we set expectations in a way to be inherently frustrating. What, you ha what we have to do, both as citizens and office holders, the leaders and the led, is understand that if we pull this off 51% of the time, that's a heck of a good day. I would argue that's true in our own lives as well. I've written about the soul of the country. I, soul in Hebrew and in Greek means breath or life. I learned this first from John Strang of Macaulay School, a uh, seventh grade Bible teacher who's most famous uh, extra credit question was, 
Who was on the road to Damascus and where was Saul going? <laughs> and Mr. Burns missed that a couple of times. Um, we've been working on that. Breath or life is what soul means in Hebrew and Greek. When, when God breathes life into mankind in Genesis, uh, it is, can be translated as soul. When Jesus said, greater love hath no man than this than to lay down his life for his friends, life could be translated as soul. It's the essence of who we are. But if you're anything like me, you don't do the right thing enough. America is, the fate of America is determined not by saints, but by sinners who manage to do one or two saintly things. That's true of Abraham Lincoln. He got just enough right, just enough of the time. It was true of Franklin Roosevelt. It's true of all of us, just enough of the time. We are fallen creatures. And so that doesn't let us off the hook, but it does set a more rational set of expectations and should, I would hope, take those who embrace a more holistic or a, even extreme view of politics that if you don't get your way all together, then the world is ending, which is a natural way to think. That way is undemocratic because democracy is inherently disputatious and messy and difficult. And as Churchill said, it's the worst form of government except for all the others. <laughs> Here's a quick Churchill story that has nothing to do with what I'm saying, but it's the only thing you'll remember. Um, <laughs> Churchill's in the men's room of the House of Commons one day. He's at the long trough. And Clement Attlee, the laborite socialist prime minister, the Bernie Sanders of England, comes in and stands next to him, and Churchill steps away. And Attlee looks at him and says, are you feeling standoffish today, Winston? And Churchill said, no, it's just that every time you see something big, you want to nationalize it. So it <laughs> has no significance whatever to that. We need to be straightforward about what we're facing. And what we're facing continu continually is a struggle between our appetites and our ambitions and our better angels. Every hour of every day in our own lives, and then when we look outward, that's true in our political life. The third thing we do need is conviction. We need to believe something. And I don't really care what it is, necessarily. But there needs to be a large moral commitment to something that is bigger than our own perpetuation of power. And this is where Abraham Lincoln's true greatness lies. Abraham Lincoln was fundamentally anti-slavery. Now, as you all may remember, every abolitionist in America in the 19th century was anti-slavery, but not every anti-slavery politician was an abolitionist. There were degrees, there were gradations of, of opinion. What Lincoln wanted to do, rather like Churchill in 1940, was keep slavery in its existing sphere. It's why he was so determined not to give in at all once he became president. There was a perfectly rational compromise. People like me on television would have said, oh, this is a very wise thing to do. Put on the table after he won the presidency. From the, the senator from Kentucky, it's the kind of thing we always did in America. We always compromised. The compromise was to take the Missouri uh, line from 1820, take it out to the east coast of California, let slavery take root in what became Arizona and New Mexico, and then the Civil War would have been avoided. Lincoln said no. William Seward, the Secretary of State and arguably a more influential Republican politician, was for it. 20,000 merchants in New York sent a letter in support of it. All the wise guys were for it. The press was for it. Lincoln said no. Why? Because he actually listened to what the white slave interest said. And what people like me, who looked like me, were saying in 1860, 61, 
was not that slavery was simply going to be contained to the, what became the Confederate States of America, but was going to be expanded. It was called the Golden Circle, the Knights of the Golden Circle. John Wilkes Booth was associated with the Knights of the Golden Circle. The center of that circle was Havana. Four presidential administrations heading into the Lincoln administration had attempted to add Cuba to the United States, not for the cigars, which would be fine, but because it was going to be a part of a slave empire. Nicaragua, parts of Mexico, the Caribbean, that was going to become a slave-based nation. If that had happened, which it was this far from happening, I think slavery would have endured into the 20th century, almost certainly. Lincoln said no, because he listened to what people said. He was curious about what they were saying. He was candid with himself and with his cabinet and his country about what it meant. And he drew a line. And as he later put it, and the war came. Why did he insist on that? He could have saved the Union without taking on slavery. He did it because he believed, as he put it again and again, that slavery was wrong and that if slavery endured, democracy could not thrive. Because you cannot selectively apply a universal assertion of human equality. It doesn't be, if, you're, if it's a universal assertion, it's universal. There cannot be classes of people. And democracy requires what he called the last best hope, borrowing that phrase from Jefferson, who called it the world's best hope. And on this Saturday, I'm sure you all will be having cupcakes. This is the anniversary of the Gettysburg Address. Um, big day, I know. In Dorkland, we love it. Um, <laughs> we get our pocket protectors, we put on our hats, it's great. When he said, this was a nation conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men were created equal. He meant everyone. And that was not universally shared. Stephen Douglas, whom he ran against twice for the Senate, once for the presidency, did not believe that. Believed that the Declaration of Independence applied only to white people. Lincoln had the moral conviction, and it was moral, to say, no, it applies to all. I am not here to eulogize Abraham Lincoln. I am not here to put him on a pedestal. Partly because if he goes onto a pedestal, he begins to lose his capacity to teach. And the remarkable thing about Lincoln, the remarkable thing about the United States, the remarkable thing about all of us, is that we do have the capacity to overcome sin and appetite to expand the possibilities of the country and the possibilities of grace. That is thrilling because it means it's up to us. And it is terrifying because, oh God, it means it's up to us. That's the question before us, forever. The last is empathy. Um, if we can't put ourselves in each other's shoes, we, we don't make it. And the most empathetic man I ever knew was George H.W. Bush, um, not just politician, but man. Uh, Bob reminded me of this story. So I haven't mentioned the 45th president, but I now will break that for a moment um, and tell you a quick story about three of my favorite topics. Donald Trump, Andrew Jackson, and George Herbert Walker Bush. I know it sounds like a joke, and there's one parachute, and the rabbi's coming in. No, no. This is a <laughs> This is a true story. So in March of 2017, President Trump announces that he's coming down to the Hermitage to embrace the Andrew Jackson legacy. And so I'm sitting at home and I think I should do something about this. And so I write an open letter to the president saying, Dear Mr. President, welcome. But if you're going to embrace Andrew Jackson, don't just embrace the crazy parts. And there are plenty of crazy parts of Andrew Jackson to embrace, right? I mean, Jackson once said his only two regrets in public life were that he had not shot Henry Clay, the Speaker of the House, and hung John C. Calhoun, his own vice president. Huh. Um, the past is prologue, as Shakespeare said. 
Um, but I wrote this, and I sent it to the newspaper in, in Nashville, uh, the Tennessean, and in a kind of a brave move, I thought, they ran it. It was the entire front page of the paper that day. And it was the, it was the only thing on the, on the, in the paper. And it had no effect whatever, of course. Um, but the next day, true story, I'm walking into lunch, and my phone rings, and it's George H.W. Bush. And President Bush had spent a lot of that winter in the hospital down in Houston. And so his staff was printing out stuff for him to read. They printed out this uh, letter. So he'd read it. He called up. He said, how you doing? I said, I'm fine, Mr. President. How are you? He said, I'm fine. He said, I read your letter to Jackson. And I thought, oh, shit, the old boy's losing it. <laughs> right? He thinks I'm writing letters to dead people. Um, I said, thank you, Mr. President. You know, actually, that was a letter to Trump about Jackson. And without missing a beat, the old man said, yeah, but Jackson will pay more attention. <laughs> um, and then he hung up. He had thought of the joke. He wanted to deliver it, and he hung up. Great, great score. Um, I miss him. Um, we have to put ourselves in each other's shoes, or it doesn't work. And so I will leave you with this story. It is a, about a story, it's about someone you've never heard of named Bennett McNichol. Bennett McNichol was a, this is key to the story, was a fairly rotund lad uh, who was a classmate of George H.W. Bush's at Greenwich Country Day School in the 1930s. There was an annual obstacle course race at Greenwich Country Day School, and Bush always won. And so in his eighth grade year, before he went off to Andover, the Macaulay of Massachusetts, as we call it. Um, he, the faculty came to him and said, would you give everybody else a head start and then go? And he said, sure. So everybody goes, Bush goes. He's going through a series of narrow barrels on the ground that's part of the obstacle course. And he pops out and he looks to his right and Bennett McNichol is stuck in a barrel. So think about that. You're the fat kid. You're stuck in a barrel. The future commander in chief of the United States is looming over you. It's a moment of maximum adolescent humiliation, right? What does Bush do? He reaches down, he pulls him out, he says, come on, Bennett, we'll finish this together. Biggest moment of Bennett McNichol's life because he tied George Bush in the annual obstacle course race. Sweet schoolboy story, right? The kind of story you would think a political family would tell about their patriarch to show what a great guy he is. Here's the thing. I didn't hear that story from a Bush. I heard it from a McNichol. The guy told the story for 70 years because it was the nicest thing anyone had ever done for him. And so I heard the story, so I went to President Bush. And I said, sir, I just heard this story about Bennett McNichol. <laughs> and the first thing Bush said was, Bennett, he loved lunch. I said, no, no. <laughs> Not the point, sir. <laughs> Says, he's still big? I said, sir, not, let's focus, let's focus. Let's focus. I said, why did you pull him out of the barrel? And President Bush looked at me genuinely as if I were crazy. And he said, well, I'd never been stuck in a barrel before, but if I had been, I'd want somebody to pull me out. You idiot, you know. <laughs> Note what he did not say. He did not say, I pulled him out of the barrel because the Bible told me so. He didn't say I pulled him out of the barrel because my mother taught me to do the right thing. He didn't say I pulled him out of the barrel because it was my moral obligation. He said I pulled him out because I might have needed help. If you recognize the equality and the dignity and the possibilities of another person, you are more likely to have your equality, your dignity, and your possibilities recognized. Democracy is a covenant. It is a promise that if we keep, it is more likely to be kept. And I firmly believe that within the soul of the country, within the soul of each of us, we have the capacity to pull people out of the barrel. And if we do that, we may just pull the country out too. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.
question. Thank you. Now we'll have cross-examination. Corker, what you got? Just kidding. Do not call on Senator Corker. Y'all got anything? You don't have to. I can just, you know, sing. I did a project with Tim McGraw not long ago. I was misinformed. I thought it was going to be with Faith. <laughs> and that asshole showed up. No, it was terrible. Don't make me call on people. Doctor. My doctor over here. Who sent his daughter to Baylor. <laughs> there is redemption. Um, so, how would you suggest that young Tell us your name. Tell oh, us your name. I'm Alicia. I'm a sophomore at Baylor. Um, <laughs> okay, speak very slowly for us. Um, okay. Okay, how would you suggest that young people like myself like engage with American democracy and like help foster a democratic culture? Great question. Um, you're doing it because you're here, and you are, in fact, the youngest person by 42 years. Um, <laughs> so be careful. You're lowering my demo considerably. Um, Michael Beschloss and I have a bet. At what point will books we write just go straight to large print? Um, you, know, you, know you're, you know you're there. Um, it's a fabulous question. I, I, I'm being sort of a smart aleck, but I mean it. You're, you're, you're engaging clearly in the conversation about the country. Um, you have to vote. You have to read everything you can and judge its accuracy for yourself, not because it comes at you with a certain visual authority. Um, and you have to decide, my friend, uh, whom we're all thinking about, uh, in these days, Nancy Pelosi, most formidable woman. She's Churchill and Manolo Blahniks, this woman. I don't care if you agree or disagree with her. She's a formidable force of, of nature. Um, and her husband, Paul, whom we know, um, we all hold in our prayers as he recovers. Um, she says, whenever someone comes to her to ask whether they should run for the house, she says, what is your why? What is your why? And so you have to, I would say that that's a great question for citizens too. What is your why? The how tends to take care of itself. What I just said a moment ago is, is the how. Vote, read the papers. Papers, by the way, are these, never mind. Um, uh, but why, why are you interested in democracy? And at our best, our generations through the years have gone to Seneca Falls, have fought at Gettysburg, have fought on Missionary Ridge, have crossed a bridge in Selma, have protested at Stonewall in New York, have projected power across the world and sought to project moral force at home to make the Declaration of Independence real. And Remember, when Dr. King comes to the end of the sermon to the March on Washington, his request, his claim, is not for special treatment. It's to live up to the creed that we set. You know, repressed wasps wrote this. Jefferson could have stood with being a little more repressed, actually, as I think about it. But we put this out here. And so I would argue that your why, if I may, should be how can we make the mission statement of the country more real? And to do that does require defending the user's manual, which is the Constitution. Great question, and good luck at that. What's it called?
Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's, just, it's really uh, embittering and, uh, and it's dangerous. So the question is, how do we deal with our neighbors? And we, the, the lines feel so deep and, and, and embittering. Um, I would argue first that it has been like this. Uh, I have a theory that, you know, we, we have a big debate in, in the historical world about were we founded in 1619 or 1776? or 1865, I would submit that this, the country we know was founded in 1965. The first integrated electorate in the United States of America was in 1968. Think about that for a second. So a multi-ethnic, multi-racial democracy has only existed in this country for 55 years. So no wonder it's hard. Right? Um, every action has a reaction, right? And there's shadow and there's sunlight and there's progress and there's reversion. It has been more vivid in recent years. You know, in 1968, the year began with Tet. Uh, that f brings Eugene McCarthy and Robert Kennedy into the race to challenge Lyndon Johnson. Johnson gets out of the race on March 31st, 1968. It was a Sunday. That morning, Dr. King had given the Sunday sermon at Washington National Cathedral, in which he offered one of the great definitions of democracy ever. King said, I can never be what I ought to be until you are what you ought to be, and you can never be what you ought to be until I am what I ought to be. That's the way God's universe is made. That's the way it is structured. We are bound together in a mutual garment of destiny. A scary thought because our habits of heart and mind matter. So how we are with our neighbors matters. Now, when I use the word neighbor, I'm gonna take this, this, this is a small thing about a very small category in life called great tweets. It's like French military victories in the 20th century, right? <laughs> it's a very short book. But about six months ago, someone tweeted out that if Doris Goodwin and Mr. Rogers had had a one night stand, I would have resulted. <laughs> I thought it was great. Doris was kind of pissed off. So she called, she said, couldn't Mr. Rogers and I have fallen in love and you were the product of our great union? I said, no, honey, he picked you up in the C-SPAN bar. You know, um, if we don't see each other as, and, and, and this is true of, again, we all, look, I don't know what the political makeup of the room is, but I suspect it's fairly mixed. Um, I don't have a partisan brain. Um, I partly blame Paul Neely for that, uh, who hired me when I was eight. Um, he violated child labor laws. Actually, it's been very painful, uh, the prosecutions we're working on. Um, but sometimes there are both sides to an issue, and sometimes there aren't. There weren't two sides to confronting Hitler. There weren't two sides to civil rights. There weren't two sides to slavery. Sometimes there's a right and there's a wrong. And Abraham Lincoln won the presidency arguing that. The difference between us is that we believe that slavery is wrong and should not be expanded. They believe it is right and should be expanded. And on that question, he said, hangs the entire issue. I believe that one side of the country in this moment, smaller size today than it was a while ago, have chosen to opt out of the constitutional conversation because they've put their own power ahead of everything else. The left could go and do this, but they haven't yet. It could happen tomorrow. It could happen this afternoon, but it hasn't yet. And to go back to candor, we don't do ourselves any favors by pretending that blame should be apportioned across the spectrum. It's just not the case. I, I pay plenty of taxes, right? 
can ask the guys at Pinnacle. They know. <laughs> I don't want to pay more taxes. I have, I differ. President Biden is my friend. I help him when I, when I can. I disagree with him on policy questions. But I know this. If the choice comes down to the Constitution or his own interest, he's going to side with the Constitution. And so it's fascinating to me that in 2022, what I just said has the capacity to be partisan, to say that a president of the United States would side with the Constitution. Remarkable. But that's where we are. And we, well, we don't do ourselves any favors by pretending that it's different. One more. I'll stop preaching. I will call on you. Mr. McCauley. Oh, no. no you, cool. All right. <clears throat> Too late. Governor yes, Haslam sir. said once he didn't know that any Republicans watch Morning Joe, but um, we're guilty. <laughs> <laughs> we really enjoy you on there. <clears throat> My wife regularly reminds me that she's had a brain crush on you for some time. I love that. <laughs> Thank you. Would you like me to sign a Grisham book for you later? <laughs> uh, two questions. It looks like the Trump-endorsed election deniers took a pretty good beating up and down the line. So... One, do you think the majority of Republicans are ready to look forward rather than backwards? And two, can Trump be defeated in the primaries? There are more people in this room who could answer that better, because I suspect there may be one or two of you who are thinking about it. Um, I find the particularly, and here's a sentence you never thought you'd say. I found the Secretary of State races across the country, even I don't say that. Um, <laughs> to be the most encouraging, right? That the election machinery um, seems to be more secure. Uh, I think the Arizona result in the governorship is fascinating. Um, and probably is the most likely sort of reality show to keep unfolding. Um, so watch, watch that space. You know, I, I grew up one of the reasons I'm standing here inflicting myself on you is Ronald Reagan captured my imagination when I was 10. Um, I, you know, as clearly uh, President Bush's biographer, I'm, I'm George W. Bush's biographer, we're doing the same thing, we're doing it for 25 years. Um, he'll probably outlive me, so that'll be unfortunate. But. Um, <laughs> He now only chews on cigars as opposed to smoking them. Um, so I'm not, I'm not a crazy liberal. Uh, and I love that you quoted Bill Haslam. I'm gonna tell him that someone quoted him. That's, that's it's the first time. Um, <laughs> text him that, would you? Um, I don't think Haslam could win today in Tennessee. Uh, I... I don't think he went to primary. Maybe he could today, but two years ago, probably not. And that tells you something, right? Um, let, me, let me do one historical thing and then I'll directly answer your question. I have, I have a, if somebody wants a thesis to write, I've been trying to get somebody to write this. I call this the 10 year question. This is the only room in America where you actually care about this. In 1990, Al Gore Jr runs unopposed for re-election to the United States Senate. Al cannot remember the name of the person they put on the ballot. It was some guy in Memphis. Believe me, I've never met a politician who could not remember who ran against them. He carried 95 counties in 1990 out of 95 counties. Ten years later, to the day, by losing the state, he loses the presidency. So what happened? That's the story. He goes from 95 to zero to losing the state and the presidency. So something happened in American politics and in Tennessee politics in that 10 years. So you have to sort of think about, what is that? 
Well, it's a little more complicated as ever because in 1992 and in 1996, Clinton and Gore carried the state, remarkably. So something happened, arguably, between 96 and 2000. There were a couple of things I would submit. One is the nationalization of politics. The fact that we all seem to have one conversation is not so much about local questions. It tends to be, but both the fundraising, and this has gotten worse, uh, gotten more pronounced through, through the years. The other is the rise of partisan media, because in 1996 is when Fox News came to our world. And I'm, I'm not someone who believes that you can put everything off on them. Uh, but it does have an effect, a demonstrable one, because it's the one thing that's kind of different in that four-year period. So that's the political world we're living in. It also shows how quickly things can change, which goes directly to your question. Are Republicans willing to go to arguing again about policy as opposed to about culture, to arguing about the differences about the relative role of the state in the marketplace, the relative projection of force against commonly agreed upon foes and rivals, which is what politics used to be about? I hope so. I think that the success of the republic depends on it. And I think that, and this is just pure punditry, so take it for what it's worth. I think the fact that President Trump announced the way he did yesterday suggests that he fears at some level that the party may want to move on. Um, we were chatting about this. It's, now he has set the field. Right. So anybody who announces is, is challenging him. And politics is always American politics is a choice. It's not a referendum. There's a remark, we have a remarkable capacity to go through a presidential election, spend billions of dollars now, all this mind share, all this energy. And then we almost before Thanksgiving forget who the other person was. Right. So no one came to the country in 2016 and said, do you want Donald Trump to be president? That wasn't the question. The question was, do you want this person or do you want Secretary Clinton? In 2020, no one said, do you want Joe Biden to be president? It was, do you want Joe Biden or do you want four more years of this? So until you know the choice, you can't know the direction. And, um, you know, I, 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 I'm a sentimentalist about uh, these things. I, I'm a quasi-romantic about politics. I do think that in the end, we tend to get it right. And I welcome the day when, uh, and I think we're closer, uh, when a Republican presidential nominee is arguing about policy and not about vote count. And um, without two functioning, reason-based, reality-based parties, the country doesn't work. It just doesn't. I'll leave you with this. Um, I think one way of thinking about 1933 to 2017 in American life is that it was a figurative conversation and debate between FDR and President Reagan, right? That there was these, and these two big questions about the role of the state and how do we project force, that was the conversation. And to switch metaphors to football, which is a dangerous thing for me, um, FDR's at the 20 over here, Reagan's at the 20 over here. LBJ was over here with FDR, George W. Bush was over here with Reagan. Most folks, Richard Nixon, Gerald Ford, George Herbert Walker Bush, Dwight Eisenhower, John Kennedy, were somewhere between the 40s. And that was the way we organized our politics. 2017 interrupted that conversation. I believe President Biden has restored that conversation. And the question that will be before us in 2024 
is do we want that conversation to continue or do we want it disrupted yet again? And my hope is that the conversation continues. Thank you all so much.